Hey friends, uh, grace to you and peace this morning from God our Father, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I got to tell you, these, uh, these texts today, I really, uh, they are cornerstones uh, for me. I've memorized them, and they, they've meant a lot to me over the years. And as they come up today, um, it is a real honor to be able to speak on them. You know, I, I like this text from, uh, from Micah. Uh, because I'll tell you, it is as relevant in our world, to our world, as it was to the world in which Micah the prophet lived. It summarizes really what the life of faith looks like. I have to admit, I just wish that the order maybe had gotten flip-flopped because the the. The ethical behavior spoken of here, the, the ethical behavior aspects of, of kindness and, and justice flow. Those things flow from our relationship with God, not vice versa. You and I today, we are challenged to walk humbly with our God. Micah is talking about a special kind of humility. It is like unto uh, the meekness uh, that Jesus praised when he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, friends, I want you to know that Jesus was not talking about the shy, timid mouse of a person who's content to serve as the world's doormat. It's not what he's talking about here at all. The most humble man. And remember, what does the Lord require us but that we humbly walk with the Lord? The most humble man or woman the meekest man or woman from a biblical standpoint is the person who has surrendered his or her life completely to God. For someone to say, for instance, I have nothing to ever ask forgiveness for is a joke. That's a joke. And that's not okay. The humblest man from the biblical standpoint is a person who has surrendered his or her life completely to God, knowing that we need a Savior. It is not I who lives, writes St. Paul. I mean, think about it. It is not I. It's not about me. It's not I who lives, writes St. Paul, but Christ lives in me. That is true humility. That's true biblical meekness. To be crucified with Christ. That kind of humility, that kind of meekness, folks, leads to tremendous power and effectiveness in living. In that relationship with the Lord, it's that relationship with the Lord that influences our very being. Our allegiance to God, our allegiance to the Lord. And what does the Lord require of us but that we love kindness, do justice, and walk humbly with our God Our allegiance, our our primary, most important allegiance is to God. From that foundation, let's then move on to the call to love kindness. Here's the most basic, folks, the most minimal call 
for the Christian, the follower of Jesus, that we should treat other people as we would like to be treated. The Old Testament law, as well as the very heart of the teachings of Jesus, lays forth the notion that kindness is to be extended even to one's enemies. Exodus 23, verse 5, insists that the children of Israel do not oppress strangers with the reminder that they were once strangers themselves. Jesus, of course, said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Thus, I got to tell you, there is no limits, there are no limits placed upon our kindness. If someone's in need, then we're going to care about them, even toward persons that we may deem undeserving. Because, folks, for Christians, for you and me, followers of Jesus, this is particularly significant because you and I, we believe if we've got this Christian faith, if we understand it, we believe that God poured out his love upon us when we were undeserving. We are also to do justice. Justice, I'll tell you, is a much, is a much larger and more complicated concept than, than kindness is. Kindness is an individual act. We were talking about that with the kids this morning. I, I see a person in need, and like the Good Samaritan, I, you, we try to help. That's part of who we are as we seek to walk in the footsteps of Jesus because that's our primary allegiance. Justice concerns the passion that you and I must have to see that every person everywhere has a decent opportunity for a healthy, wholesome, rewarding life. It's the passion that, that Abraham Lincoln had when he saw a, a, a slave girl being sold on an auction block like a horse, like a cow would be sold. And here was this crowd of people around watching it who didn't give a rip, who didn't care at all. This this slave girl was being sold away from her family. And Abraham Lincoln saw the fright and the terror in her eyes. This thing must go, Lincoln is reported to have said, and he was referring to the institution of slavery. And he dedicated his life to the destruction, folks, of that barbaric institution. During the Civil War, one of his generals came to Lincoln and said, isn't it good that God is on our side? And to which Lincoln, to his credit, said, that's not what this is about at all. The question is not, is God on our side justifying what we're doing? The question is, are we on God's side? That's what we have to ponder. That's what we have to grapple with. Folks, no concept is more Christian or more, what we pray, more American than the demand for justice and law. Wherever there are people who are oppressed, 
whether it be politically, economically, racially, or whatever form that oppression may take, folks, we've got to raise our voices. The prophets of the Old Testament and Jesus himself, they did it all the time. For who, people who recognize that their lives have been bought with the blood uh, of Christ, who gave his life for us on the cross, who said, it's not about me, it's about giving my life to others. That's our mindset as Christians. For those who recognize that their lives have been bought with the blood of the cross, turning inward, folks, is repulsive. We're here today because God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's who we are. We are here today because a man from Galilee cared more about us than he did himself. If our response is, is to that is only to shut ourselves off in our little designer cocoons, while the rest of the world can fend for itself, then we, as individuals and in a, as a nation, are in deep, deep spiritual trouble. Where there are people who are suffering, we have a mission. That mission has to do with the souls, it has to do with the minds and the bodies of God's less fortunate children. That's our call. We are called. We just sang about it. If we offer them a bread without Christ, folks, we are at fault as a church. But as the epistle of James reminds us, we dare not offer them Christ without bread either. Doing justice Folks, doing justice is much more complicated than loving kindness, but it is equally a part of Christian witness. It certainly ruffles feathers, though. It certainly ruffles feathers. Why am I here? Why are you here? What's the purpose for Christ's coming 2,000 years ago? Is it just about the sweet by and by? I hope that you and I are walking humbly with God. That that's the voice we're listening to. That that's the voice we're, we're arguing with, where we're grappling with, we're questioning, we're wondering. I hope that you and I, we're walking humbly with God and then loving kindness and doing justice. This little portion of Scripture is indeed life's instruction manual. And Jesus' life, ministry, and teachings, whom we have our eyes on, build upon it. These texts today are certainly thought provokers given the time we're in right now I encourage you read them over a few more times this coming week Amen